Hello again, Psych370 students, and welcome to the first of what I think will be a total of five video lectures for this week, week four. As you can see in our course schedule here in the syllabus, we're now into unit two of the course. And during this unit, we're going to be focusing on an important form of learning called classical conditioning, or sometimes we call it Pavlovian conditioning. So your assigned readings for this unit are chapter three and chapter four in the textbook, but we're actually going to split chapter three up and cover it over the course of the next two weeks. So this week, we'll cover about the first 25 pages of the chapter. We will finish that chapter next week. And then during week six of the course, we'll turn our attention to chapter four, which discusses applications of classical conditioning. So that's the plan for this unit of the course. And in this video lecture, I'm going to say a few introductory things about classical conditioning. I'm also going to go through some terminology with you. So I'll talk about the unconditioned stimulus, the conditioned response, and so on. But before I get to all of that, there are a few things that I want to mention first. For one thing, the video that you're about to watch here is actually an excerpt from a lecture that I gave the last time that I taught this course via Zoom. So during the spring 2021 semester when I taught this course, we would have live Zoom meetings as a class. Okay, so it wasn't fully asynchronous like it is this semester. And what you're about to see here is part of one of those Zoom classes. In fact, the first three video lectures for this week are all excerpts from previous Zoom classes. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Related to that, I also launched a few polls during the part of the class that you're about to see. So I'd open up a poll in Zoom with a question related to the material. The students would submit their answers to that question. And so you obviously won't be able to respond to those polls the way those students did, but you'll know whenever I've launched one, I always announced it whenever I opened up a poll. I also described what the question was, and so even though you won't be able to officially take part in the poll, you can still think about the question. You can still try to come up with what you think the answer would be, which will be good practice. Uh, and then finally, one last thing to mention here is that I began this Zoom class by playing a video that, for copyright reasons, I can't include in this video when I upload it to YouTube. So the video is from The Office the TV show. And if I try to upload this video to YouTube with that clip in there, it's going to get blocked. So if you've never seen the clip before, and you may have, it's the one where Jim classically conditions Dwight so that Dwight starts salivating whenever he hears a certain sound. So you may have seen it before, but if you haven't, or if you just want to watch it again, just click on the link that I've made available in Canvas. The link is available in this week four video lectures section of Canvas. And then you can watch this little prank that Jim here plays on Dwight. Okay. Well, without further ado, I will turn it over now to that excerpt from the Zoom class, which picks up right after that video clip from the office that I just mentioned. Okay. So I'm sure that a lot of you guys have seen that before. Um, but for copyright reasons, I'm not gonna be able to include that clip in the video of today's meeting that I'm gonna be uploading to YouTube. So if you're watching this later on YouTube, uh, then that video will have been cut out of it. Okay? So I'll just summarize it for you really quick here uh, by saying that there are these two guys, right? Jim and Dwight. And for a while, this guy, Jim, plays this sound, right, for Dwight. And then immediately after the sound, he gives him an Altoid. So Dwight is getting these repeated pairings, right, of this stimulus, the sound, with this stimulus, the Altoid. And then eventually, Jim finally plays the sound without giving Dwight the Altoid. And we see Dwight making these responses, right? What we would call conditioned responses to the sound. So for example, he puts his hand out and he says that his mouth tastes really bad all of a sudden, right? So that's a good example of classical conditioning. And since you guys have all taken intro to psych before, I'm sure that you recognized the scientist that Jim referred to in the video as this guy. Ivan Pavlov, who is obviously the man after whom Pavlovian conditioning is named. By the way, guys, I tend to use the term classical 
conditioning. And in my experience, that is the more common term. Uh, but we're talking about the same thing, regardless of whether we call it classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning. You might even hear it called respondent conditioning. There are a few different names out there for this form of learning that Pavlov discovered. And obviously that discovery is what Pavlov is best known for, especially among psychologists, but he actually wound up with a pretty amazing resume as a scientist. In fact, he didn't even get around to studying classical conditioning until he was already in his 50s. By then he was already an accomplished researcher. In fact, he won a Nobel Prize, but he won it for his work on the digestive system. And that research led quite naturally to his discovery of classical conditioning, but I've always found it interesting that even though Pavlov is remembered for good reason as one of the most influential psychologists of all time, he actually considered himself a physiologist. So, as I think you know, and as that video mentioned, the legend has it that Pavlov first discovered classical conditioning when he noticed that his dogs would salivate when they heard a bell that had been paired with food, right? That's the classic story. But as it turns out, the actual dis uh, story behind that discovery is a little different. For one thing, it's not clear that he ever used a bell as his condition stimulus. He did use metronomes, buzzers, whistles, several other stimuli, but it's debatable whether he ever used a bell. Uh, and for another thing, salivation wasn't actually the first conditioned response that he observed his dogs making. So guys, Pavlov had been able to conduct his Nobel Prize winning research on digestion, largely because he developed surgical procedures that allowed him to collect and measure the secretions of the digestive system. And obviously saliva was one of those secretions that he was interested in but so was the gastric juice that was secreted by his dog's stomachs. So he rigged up a contraption like this that would funnel that fluid into a graduated cylinder here so that he could see how much of it his dogs would secrete as they ate various kinds of food. Okay. And what fascinated him was that he saw his dogs doing this. He saw them secreting this fluid before they were actually given any food. So as soon as they saw the food, or even just the person who typically brought them their food, their stomachs would start cranking out this gastric juice. Okay. And so Pavlov originally referred to these responses as psychic secretions. Okay, He called them psychic secretions because they seemed to be elicited by the mere expectation of food rather than by food itself. By the way, as a side note here, Pavlov's lab actually collected a lot of this because back in the day, there was quite a market for it as a remedy for indigestion. So they would collect it and then sell it to help increase the lab's budget. Okay, It was apparently quite the side hustle for Pavlov and company back in the day. According to one uh, source that I read, they increased their budget by 70% by selling off this excess fluid that they collected like this. So anyway, he originally observed these gastric secretions by his dogs. That was the original psychic reflex that, uh, that Pavlov discovered. But of course, as his research progressed, he eventually switched over to a more carefully controlled setup like this, which allowed him to present the dogs with more precisely controlled stimuli, like the sound of a metronome or a buzzer, and to collect their saliva directly from the tubes or the ducts that carried it from the salivary glands to the mouth. And, you know, since those salivary responses have become sort of the classic story behind classical conditioning, they're what I'll typically refer to when I talk about Pavlov's research. But I think it's interesting that the original discovery was a little different, both in terms of the response itself and in terms of the actual stimulus that elicited it. But anyway, that's probably enough history. Uh, so now I wanna start looking at classical conditioning in a bit more detail. And guys, the first thing that we should probably do here is review these four important terms that we'll need to use a lot over the course of these next few weeks. So those four terms that I'm talking about are unconditioned stimulus, or the US, 
unconditioned response, the UR, the conditioned stimulus, or the CS, and the conditioned response, or the CR. Okay? So we've got an unconditioned stimulus and a conditioned stimulus, right? a US and a CS. We've also got an unconditioned response and a conditioned response. Now, guys, the textbook actually uses the terms conditional and unconditional, okay? And to be fair, those terms are actually a more accurate translation of what Pavlov actually meant in his original writings. But guys, at this point, the terms conditioned and unconditioned are just so well ingrained, I think, in the vernacular of psychology that I'm going to use them instead. That's what you'll usually hear them called, okay? The conditioned response, the unconditioned stimulus. That's what people usually say. Okay. But the textbook does use the terms conditional and unconditional. And if you prefer those, if those make more sense to you, then please, by all means, use them instead. Okay. They're not wrong. They're just, they're just not as common. Okay. Uh, but anyway, now let's start defining these terms. First of all, the unconditioned stimulus. Guys, the defining characteristic of the unconditioned stimulus is that it naturally elicits a response, some kind of response, okay? So the US, the unconditioned stimulus, is typically something that is already significant in some way to the person or the animal. Significant enough, at least, that they already have this sort of built-in, reflexive, naturally occurring response to that stimulus. And of course, that response that the unconditioned stimulus elicits is called the unconditioned response, or the UR. So the unconditioned stimulus elicits the unconditioned response. The animal performs the UR in response to the US. And guys, the unconditioned part of these terms just refers to the fact that no learning is required, no conditioning is required for this stimulus to elicit this response, okay? It does that already. It does that before any conditioning has taken place, hence the term unconditioned, okay? No conditioning required. So, for example, in Pavlov's most famous research, the unconditioned stimulus was food, right? It was actually meat. It was this meat powder that they'd give to the dogs, and the dogs had this reflexive, naturally occurring response to that meat, which was that they would salivate, right? And obviously they didn't have to learn to do that, right? They didn't have to go through any conditioning to acquire that response to meat. They did it already. Dogs just naturally salivate in response to meat, right? So in the Pavlov example, meat is the unconditioned stimulus here and salivation to the meat is the unconditioned response. So now, let me launch a quick poll here to quiz you on what the unconditioned stimulus would have been in that example from before about the office with Jim and Dwight. Uh, so what do you think? What was the U.S. in that example? What's the unconditioned stimulus in this example where Jim is classically conditioning Dwight? Again, I'm going to tell you what the right answer was after we, after we wrap this poll up. I just want to have you guys take a stab at it. What do you think the unconditioned stimulus is here? So, um, it's the Altoid, right? That's the unconditioned stimulus. It's the mint. That's the unconditioned stimulus. Because Dwight doesn't have to learn anything to have a response to that stimulus, right? He already has a response to it. Right? It, that, that stimulus, that Altoid, already elicits salivation even before Jim has put him through that classical conditioning procedure. So in that example, the Altoid is serving as the unconditioned stimulus. That's the no conditioning required stimulus. Right? And when Dwight salivates in response to that Altoid, he's performing an unconditioned response. You are. But then, of course, classical conditioning is all about taking that unconditioned stimulus. It's all about taking that stimulus that naturally elicits a response and pairing it, 
with another stimulus that, at least at first, does not elicit a particular response. And so we often say that that other stimulus is initially neutral, okay? We call it the neutral stimulus, or the NS, because it's a stimulus that the animal doesn't really have much of a response to, at least not much of an observable response to, not at first. But again, we pair that neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. So we present the neutral stimulus, then we present the unconditioned stimulus. Here's the NS, here's the US. Over and over again, we pair those stimuli like that. And as a result of those pairings, that once neutral stimulus becomes what we call a conditioned stimulus, or CS becomes that once it starts eliciting a response, which it will eventually do. Okay, so eventually that stimulus that you've paired with the US will come to elicit a response. And of course that response is called the conditioned response, the CR. So for example, like I said before, one of the stimuli that Pavlov would often pair with food for his dogs was the ticking sound of a metronome. And at first that sound was neutral in the sense that the dogs didn't really have much of a response to it. It certainly didn't make them salivate. But because that sound reliably preceded the food, because the dogs got repeated pairings of that sound followed by the food, the sound eventually started making the dogs salivate, right? So over and over again, the dogs keep hearing this sound then getting the food. Hey, there's that sound again. Hey, here's some food. There's the sound again. Here's some food again, right? Sound, food, sound, food over and over again. So they eventually learned to predict the food based on the sound, right? They eventually learned that the sound was a signal that the food was about to occur. And so eventually the sound by itself was enough to elicit, to elicit salivation, even when it wasn't followed by the food. And so at that point, we'd say that that sound of that metronome had been converted through this conditioning process from the neutral stimulus that it started out as to a conditioned stimulus that now we listed salivation as a conditioned response. So guys, the acquisition of that conditioned response, that change in how an animal or a person responds to a particular stimulus, that is the change in behavior that makes classical conditioning an important form of learning. Okay? Because remember, learning is all about changes in behavior that result from experience, right? A change in behavior due to experience, that's our definition of learning. So in classical conditioning, there is a change in behavior, right? The animal acquires a new response to a certain stimulus, or in other cases, it acquires a different response than the one it had previously to a stimulus. And that change in behavior is caused by experience. It's caused by the animal experiencing these repeated pairings of two stimuli to the point that it learns to associate them and to anticipate one after it detects the other one. So classical conditioning is definitely a phenomenon that satisfies our definition of learning. Now, I should also point out here that in classical conditioning, uh, the conditioned response and the unconditioned response are sometimes the same response, right? So for example, in this case, with the Pavlov example, the UR is salivation, right? The dog salivates in response to meat. That's the unconditioned response. And the CR is also salivation. The dog also learns to salivate in response to the sound of the metronome. So that's the conditioned response. So sometimes the CR and the UR are the same like that, or at least similar. But that will not always be the case, all right? So lots of people seem to think, including some textbook authors, believe it or not, seem to think that in classical conditioning, the person or the animal always winds up making the same response to both of these stimuli, like the response to the US gets sort of copied over somehow so that it's also elicited by the CS. But again, that is not always how it works. Sometimes the conditioned response and the unconditioned response can actually be quite different from one another, okay? And I'll actually talk about a few cases like that next week because they're very relevant to the discussion that we need to have about theories of classical conditioning. 
So sometimes the CR and the UR will differ from each other. Okay? In fact, sometimes they'll be complete opposites of one another. But sometimes they're the same. So whenever they are the same, the way to tell them apart is to look at what elicits them. Okay? What triggers them? What causes them? What brings them out? What elicits the response? The unconditioned response, again, is elicited by the unconditioned stimulus, right? So the UR is elicited by some stimulus that started out non-neutral, right? The unconditioned response is the response the animal already had before any conditioning took place. And the conditioned response is elicited by the conditioned stimulus, right? So the CR is elicited by the stimulus that started out as a neutral stimulus. So again, the conditioned response is the one that wasn't there before, but now, thanks to all those pairings, thanks to that conditioning, now the animal has acquired this conditioned response to that previously neutral stimulus. Okay. Now, before we move on, let me quiz you one more time here with another quick poll. This time, I'm still asking about the example from before, about Jim and Dwight. This time though, I'm asking you what the conditioned stimulus is. Okay, so what do you think? What was the CS in that example? You said before that the US was the Altoid, right? Because Dwight didn't have to learn to respond to the Altoid. He had a pre-existing response to the Altoid, right? No conditioning required for the Altoid to elicit salivation. So the Altoid was the US. But the CS, like most of you guys said here, was that computer sound, right? Uh, I've got it somewhere. Is it here? Yeah. That sound, right? So that was the conditioned stimulus because, again, it started out neutral, right? At first, Dwight didn't have much of a response to that sound. It definitely didn't make him salivate or extend his hand or anything like that. But after Jim repeatedly paired that sound with the Altoid, Dwight acquired those responses to it. So because of those pairings, right? because of that conditioning process, that sound converted from a neutral stimulus to a conditioned stimulus once it started eliciting these conditioned responses from Dwight. Okay. okay, so let me stop the share for just a minute here. So do you guys have any questions about those those terms, those sort of components of classical conditioning, those four key terms. So, I mean, it's probably review for you from intro, right? I mean, I'm sure you covered classical conditioning in intro, uh, but people do often struggle with these terms, right? Even people who've had intro before. So make sure you're good on them, okay? On those terms and on these abbreviations for those terms, because again, we're gonna be using that stuff a lot over these next few weeks as we focus on classical conditioning. Right. Okay, I'm gonna stop this video lecture there. The next one we'll pick up from there with a little more introductory stuff about classical conditioning. But as always, if you have any questions, then please let me know. Okay, take care guys.